You are about to be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. For the next hour and 30 minutes, this program will present in person such bright stars as... Fred Allen, Jack Carson. Portland Hoffa. Dennis King. Beatrice Lilly. Doris Mercury. Ed Wynn. <laughs> the West Point Choir. Meredith Wilson. And my name, darlings, is Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. So listen, America, the curtains of America. We're going to fill your pile of full of stars. The Big Show, 90 minutes with the most scintillating personalities in the entertainment world. Brought to you this Sunday and every Sunday at the same time as the Sunday feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And here is your hostess. The glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darling, a special show train brought our audience to see the big show. More than 3,000 people came from in on the New Haven Railroad show train from Boston, Providence, Westerly, Hartford, Berlin, Meriden, Wallingford, New Haven, Bridgeport, Bridgeport, Westport, and Saugatuck, Norwalk, and South Norwalk, Darien, New London, and Stanford. Oh! And they're all here for an evening of laughs except 243 daily commuters who got off the train from force of habit and went to their offices. <laughs> At Bridgeport, you're not laughing. <laughs> These show trains are something new in show business. It uh, used to be I would take a play to a theater in Boston. Now they bring Boston to me. Wait, why does she stop talking? Oh, what a to-do about a show train. Well, that's the trouble with a woman MC. Yeah, but when do we get on the show? Well, who knows? Maybe she'll wave a green lantern. Yeah? She... Where is the green lantern? Well, wait till she turns around. It's usually on the caboose, you know. <laughs> Fred Allen, Jack Carson, and Ed Wynn. <laughs> Did you hear what I was just saying, fellas? A whole train full of people coming from as far away as Boston just to see this show. Isn't it exciting? <laughs> well, isn't it? Sure is. Are you gentlemen from Bridgeport? Tell her off, Jack. You leave it to me, Fred. I can handle these bits. Yes. So you got an audience that came in on a show train. Big deal. If you can't get an audience any other way, you railroad people into the theater. <laughs> <laughs> How's that, Fred? Good boy, Jack. Thank you. But, Fred, darling, think of it. 3,000 people came here on a train just for this program. Tallulah, it just goes to show you what people will do to get away from television. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was so good, Fred. I like that much you just said. Well, thanks, Ed. It's your turn. You get in there and tell Oh, them. I certainly shall. I don't see what's so exciting about a show train. It's not a new idea, you know. No? Well, 10 years ago, I opened a show of mine in Boston... And 1,200 people got up in the middle of the first act and took a train to New York. <laughs> now, you silly, fellas... Right? Yes, it yes, sure Steve, forgot that, wasn't it, silly? Anyway, however... <laughs> now, you fellas just can't stand a woman being a mistress of ceremonies at the biggest show in radio. Are you kidding? I'm through with radio. I, I've been promoted to television. Certainly, me too. I graduated out of radio long ago into television. Well, I've even graduated out of television. <laughs> I'm in a new medium, social security. <laughs> uh, why don't you fellas stop? I have seen you on television. Or should that be, I've seen you on television, why don't you fellas stop? So, Lula, what's the use of arguing? You know deep down in your larynx that all you can do with the radio is listen, but in television, you can see a lot of action. I can see more action looking out of my window. Across the street, there's plenty of action. And they don't stop every two minutes for a commercial. <laughs> well, they certainly do commercials better on television, Tallulah. 
They certainly do them better than they do on radio. When they fry a steak on television, you can actually smell it. That one's too easy, darling. I won't take advantage of it. <laughs> Come on, Fred. You, you get in here and tell her. Huh? Well, I, I don't know much about television, but I would like to say a few words in favor of Social Security. <laughs> and all I have to say to you, Tallulah, is you should live so long. <laughs> Thank you, darling. That's the youngest I've been on this program in months. And I hope all of you live long enough to see an act like this presented on television. It's the West Point Choir singing the core. 180 cadets in full dress, brass buttons, white gloves. Get that on your television screen. 180 all in one act? That's right, darling, and I've met every one of them personally. <laughs> Sometimes it seems a shame to take the money on this show. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I want you to meet alphabetically Cadets Alk, Alderman, Andrews, Acklam, Alberton, Baggerton, Cadets. Weren't they wonderful, Jack? Well, yes, they're all right for girls. For girls? They're all men. What's better for men than girls? <laughs> Bridgeport, you're not laughing. And only a snicker from Westport and Sogatuck. 
Ah, West Point. I could have gone to West Point, but I, I, I chose Vassar instead. Vassar? Hmm. You were Vassar? Sure. I'd still be there if I hadn't tried out for the swimming team. <laughs> Well, Jack, darling, you could never stand the rigors of West Point, Jack. Now, look, those boys told me that every morning they hike, they drill, they march, all that before breakfast. Well, so what? Look at me this morning. Must I, darling? I awoke at six, jumped out of bed, opened the front door, picked up the newspaper with one hand, two bottles of milk and a pint of cream with the other, and didn't drop a thing. What's so tremendous about that? <clears throat> no string in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> A Bridgeport. That was no time to laugh. <laughs> Tallulah, I'd like to ask you a question. Yes, darling. Well, don't answer until I ask you. How about you and me going out after the show, huh? Uh, going out where, darling? Well, we could go anywhere. A stork club or uh, my apartment. Or to El Morocco or to my apartment. Or to 21 or... My apartment? I heard the apartment, Jack. You said it three times. I have a three-room apartment. <laughs> if I go out at all, Jack, I'd prefer going to the colony for dinner, then to the theater, and then to a night spot for some dancing. Oh, and... Tallulah, that sounds wonderful. Look, you do that, then I'll meet you at my apartment after. You must be joking. Bridgeport doesn't seem to agree with you. <laughs> well, here's somebody Bridgeport will agree with. My favorite actor just walked into the theater, one of Broadway's greatest, Mr. Dennis King. <laughs> At the Biltmore Theater here in New York, darlings, a new play is providing great excitement. The play is Billy Budd, Lewis Cox and R.H. Chapman's dramatization of Herman Melville's classic novel of the sea. We are privileged to hear a scene from that play now, starring Dennis King and Billy Budd. Billy Bird is the story of a young English seaman pressed into service aboard HMS Indomitable, a British warship at sea against the French in the year 1798. It is not an ordinary story of war at sea, but of the subtle conflict between a man of natural goodness and simplicity and a petty tyrant of unnatural evil, allied with the merciless dictates of naval discipline. Billy Budd's violent reaction to injustice has resulted in the death of his tormentor. In irons, he awaits the verdict of the court-martial being held in Captain Vere's cabin. Captain Vere, having witnessed the killing, highly sympathetic to Billy Budd's cause, feeling for him as he would for his own son, is forced, nevertheless, to intervene in the court-martial as senior officer of the king, responsible to the admiralty, for the carrying out of naval law. As the scene opens, Captain Vere, portrayed by Dennis King, takes a hand in the deliberations of his junior officers. I think it's I think Have you anything to say, Mr. Ratcliffe? Yes, sir. Claggett was killed because Bud couldn't speak. In the sense that he stammers, he's a cripple. You don't hang a man for that. For speaking the only way he could. Mr. Wyatt? If we condemn him, it's the same thing as condoning the lie the master at arms clearly told. I... I'd have struck him, too. Good. Then, gentlemen, as we agree, we can reach a verdict at once. Uh, just a moment, gentlemen. Yes, Captain Beer. Hitherto, I've been a witness at this trial no more. And I hesitate to interfere, except at this clear crisis, you ignore one fact we cannot close our eyes to. Uh, with your pardon, sir, as a senior member of this court, I must ask you if you now act as our commanding officer or as a private man. As convening authority, Mr. Seymour, I summon this court... I must review its findings and approve them before they go to the Admiralty. Aye, aye, sir. That is your right. No right. Which of us here has rights? This is my duty and I must perform it. Bud has killed a man, his superior officer. We have found a verdict, sir. Seymour, I know that. 
But we are not free to choose as though we were private citizens. The Admiralty has its code. Do you think it cares who Bud is? Who you and I are? We don't forget it, sir, but surely Claggart's tales were simply lies. We've established that. Aye, but the mutinies of last year were brute facts and must not come again. If the men should think we're afraid... Captain, how could they? They certainly know Bud is no mutineer. Of course not. Since he came on board, he's done more to keep the crew in hand than any of us. That's true. The men took naturally to him. As officers, we are concerned to keep this ship effective as a weapon. And the law says what we must do in such a case as this. Now, come, you know the facts and the mutiny acts provisions. At sea, in time of war, an enlisted man strikes his superior officer and the blow is fatal. The mere blow alone would hang him. Well, then the men on board know that, as well as you and I. And we acquit him. The men have sense. They know the penalty to follow. And yet, it does not follow. But they know Bud, sir, and Claggart too, I dare say. Would they not applaud the decision that frees Bud? <laughs> they would thank us. String him to a yard arm and they'll turn around and rescue him and string us up instead. Aye, that's the point. It's twice as dangerous to hang the boy as it would be to let him go. If there's a mutinous temper in the crew, sir, condemning Bud would surely set it off. That is possible. Whatever step we take, the risk is great, but it is ours. That is what makes us officers. If by our lawful rigor, mutiny comes, there is no blame for us. But if in fear, miscalled a kind of mercy, we pardon but against specific order, and then the crew revolts, how culpable and weak our verdict would appear. What shame to us and what a deadly blow to discipline. I concede that, sir, but this case is exceptional. And pity, if we are men, is bound to move us, Captain. So am I moved. Yet we cannot have warm hearts betraying heads that should be cool. In such a case ashore, an upright judge does not allow the pleading tears of women to touch his nature. Here at sea, the heart, the female in a man, weeps like a woman. She must be ruled out, hard though it may be. Still silent. Conscience, perhaps... Your private consciences move you. Aye, that's it, sir. How can we condemn this man and live at peace again within ourselves? We have our standards, ethics, if you like. You all feel I can see that in intent, the boy is innocent. Does that count for nothing? His whole attitude, his motive, count for nothing? If his intent the was... intent or non-intent of but is nothing to the purpose. In a court more merciful than martial, it would extenuate and shall, at the last assizes, set him free. But here we have these alternatives only. Condemn or let go. But it seems to me we've got to consider the problem as a moral one, sir. Despite the fact that we are not moralists. When Claggart told you his lie, the case immediately went beyond the scope of military justice. I too feel that. But do these gold stripes across our arms attest that our allegiance is to nature? To the king, sir. I, Ratcliffe. And though the sea be the element whereon we move and have our being as sailors, is our official duty hence to nature... No. So little is that true that we resign our freedom when we put this on. And when war is declared, are we the fighters commissioned to destroy, consulted first? What bitter salt leagues move between our codes and God's own judgments? We are conscripts, everyone, upright in this uniform of flesh. There is no truce to war born in the womb. We fight at command. All I know is that I can't sit by and see Bud hang. I say we fight by order, by command of our superiors, and our duty lies in this, that we are servants only. The Admiralty doesn't want service like that. What good would it do? Who'd profit by Bud's death? Do you deny us the right to act like men? Do you want to make us murderers? Wyatt, control yourself. What is this vessel you serve in, Wyatt? An ark of peace? Go count her guns. Then tell your conscience to lie quiet if you can. But that is war. This would be downright killing. It's all war, Ratcliffe. War to the death for all of us. Ah, you see that, Seymour. That this war began before our time. And will end long after it. Couldn't we mitigate the penalty if we convict No, him? Ratcliffe, the penalty is prescribed. Uh, I'd, I'd like to think it over, Captain. I realize the private conscience moves you and I honor it. But here we have the Mutiny Act for Justice. No child can own a closer, tighter parent than can that act to what it stems from, war. War has no business with anything but surfaces. War's child, the Mutiny Act, is featured like the father. Aye, sir. Could you stand Bud's murder on your conscience? Wyatt, hold your tongue. What do you want of us? Sit down, sir. Let him speak. I won't bear a hand to hang a man I know is innocent. My blood's not cold enough. I can't give the kind of judgment you want to force on us. 
I ask to be excused from sitting upon this board. Do you know what you're saying? Sit down and hold your tongue. The kind of judgment I ask of you is only this, Wyatt. That you recognize your function in this ship. Can't you see that you must first strip off the uniform you wear, and after that your flesh, before you can escape the case at issue here? Decide you must, Wyatt. We are the law. Law orders us to act and shows us how. Do you imagine Seymour or Ratcliffe here or I would not save this boy if he could see a way consistent with our duties? A quick but if you can. Show us how to save him without putting aside our function. Or if you can't do that, teach us how to put by our responsibility and not betray ourselves. Can you do this? Speak, man, speak. Show us how. Save him, Wyatt. And you save us all. You recognize the logic of the choice I force upon you. But do not think me pitiless in thus demanding sentence on a luckless boy. I feel as you do for him. But even more, I feel there is a grace of soul in him that shall forgive the law we bind him with and pity us stretched upon the cross of choice. Well, gentlemen, will you decide? Gentlemen, have you reached a decision? He is condemned, sir. So be it. Dennis King, our congratulations on the stirring performance and the scene from your new Broadway success, Billy Budd. And thanks also to Martin Blaine, Horace Brehm, and Gerald Moore, who so ably assisted you. Dennis, darling, I'm so glad you were able to come over for me tonight. Oh, think no more about it, Tallulah. I came the moment I got your call. Ah, you're so sweet. (laughs) And while you're here, Dennis, darling, may I ask one more... No, please don't degrade yourself, Tallulah, by asking me. I'd be only too happy to do it. Do what? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to appear on this benefit for Miss Bankhead, (laughs) who has been absent from the Broadway stage for, lo, these many... Benefit! Benefit for whom? Courage, my dear. Courage, 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 darling. I know it's a harsh word, but it's no reflection on you as an artist. At some point in our careers, we must all face the vegetables of the theater, the vagaries of the theaters. I can't pronounce it either. The vicissitudes of fortune. But, Dennis, I am not facing anything. I know, my darling. The future always seems bleak at a time like this. Now, courage. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in raising this fun tonight for an artist whom I imagine many of you are too young to remember, (laughs) I appeal to you as an old friend of Miss Bankhead, or to put it more accurately, Miss Bankhead (laughs) is an old friend of mine. Venice, what are you doing? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, go back with me in time to the halcyon days of the theatre, when this fine actress, who has known better matinees, gave to the theatre-going public some of the finest performances of yesteryear. This grand old lady of the theatre, <laughs> who once was the star of Little Foxes, now finds the wolf at her door. <laughs> or, if you can't remember her as the great actress she was, Try to think of her as a human being. (laughs) I'll wait. (laughs) A lady who in her declining years finds herself in a declining, declining medium. (gasps) All the shame, the ignominy, the degradation, the fickleness of faith, the loneliness of it all. 
Bridgeport, you're not laughing. <laughs> you're not crying, Bridgeport. Give, ladies and gentlemen, give to this, this little lady who in better days brought joy to your hearts and who now is reduced to asking for a little of that joy for herself. Now, follow my example. I will myself start the ball rolling with three dollars. <laughs> uh, just a minute, Buster. Who told you I needed a benefit? Well, it seemed rather obvious, my dear. Nobody in the theatre has seen you in months. Your name hasn't been on any theatre marquee in a year or more. Your picture was removed from the wall at Sardis. You, you, your maid at the Theatre Guild is marked Address Unknown. Address Unknown? Why, I've been on the big show in radio. Oh, radio! Well, no wonder we never heard of you. Wait! <laughs> that was spontaneous. Very excellent, too. Very marvellous. Very marvellous. But I'll tell, I'll tell the old crowd I found you. Now, naturally, I won't tell them where I picked you well, up. Now, but... darling, you can tell them I'm the star of the big show. The biggest show in radio. Uh, yes. uh, I am known as the glamorous, unpredictable, and wealthy Tallulah Banker. <laughs> My salary on the radio runs into thousands of dollars a week. Really? You make all that money by merely talking through this tall, thin, metallic contrivance? <laughs> oh, my darling, more than I ever made in the theatre. Well, what do you know? Uh, Tallulah, may I speak to you for a moment? Oh, well, of course, darling. Listen, darling, uh, have you got a dollar for a cup of coffee, dear? I haven't, got a, I haven't eaten dear. in weeks, dear. I, oh, I really? Sorry, darling. Oh, well, of course, my darling, Dennis. And ladies and gentlemen, and this fine old gentleman who most of you, I imagine, are too young to remember the vagabond king, <laughs> is now a vagabond himself. And I would like to start the ball rolling with uh, a two dollars and twenty cents. <laughs> back in a moment with all our other stars, but first, darlings, I would like to ring my chimes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
The Big Show. This is the National Broadcasting Company's Sunday extravaganza with the most scintillating personalities in show business. The Big Show, the Sunday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival, is brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. By Chesterfield, the cigarette that has, for you, mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. The cigarette that brings you Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. And by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pains of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. The big stars in this program are Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Dennis King, Portland Hoffa, Beatrice Lilly, Lauritz Melchior, Ed Wynn, Meredith Wilson, and his big show orchestra and chorus. And every week, your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, the big show is back in New York after a week in Hollywood. And with all due respect to our friends on the West Coast... It is a pleasure to come back to this large, beautiful center theater, which is spacious enough to accommodate our audience of 3,000 people who came here tonight on the New Haven Railroad show train from as far away as Boston. (laughs) Well, darlings, bless you, darlings. The studio we had in Hollywood was very small, but it held only 300 people. And they were packed in so tight, I had trouble reading my script. <clears throat> and that studio, they were breathing on my glasses or something that I missed out here. And that studio was so small and had such a low ceiling. When I ordered frog's legs for lunch, the frog's legs were squatting. <laughs> <laughs> That's a jolly one. <laughs> Don't be lily bitter. <laughs> Why, Lulu to Birkenhead. <laughs> uh, well, Lady Kiel. <laughs> Bee, darling, it's been ages since I've seen you. Let me look at you. But you know, I haven't seen you in years, Tallulu. Let me look at you. Mm. Well, imagine that. I can hardly believe it. Oh, no. Poor dear. Well, that's the way it goes. Well, time marches on. Darling, you look simply adorable. (laughs) Well, I was just thinking how extraordinary well you look, Tallulah. Well, a day or two of rest and you'll be your old self. (laughs) My dear, you're always your old self. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you're sweet. (laughs) Well, now we've exhausted ourselves, let's talk about something new. You know, I've just got back. What's the gossip around town? Gossip? I'm mm. darling, have I got gossip for you, Beatty. You know, I just got back from Hollywood and I Oh, heard... by the way, before I forget, Tallulah, I ran across Noel last week and he told me to be sure oh, to... Oh, Noel, right, darling. Of course, I just saw him last month at a party at the home of... Um, uh, oh, oh, what's his name? You mean uh, Jeffrey? Oh, uh, yes. The man we met on the Riviera. Do you remember, darling? And he came in that, in that night full of... Uh... Oh, that's the one. Oh, do you remember what I... <laughs> I'll never forget the way she... (laughs) Do you know, after that, he went to the hospital for six months. Oh, Beatty, I'm so (laughs) sorry. Well, so much for frivolous gossip. Let's get down to something serious. How is the male situation around town? Oh, didn't you hear? No. They've cut down deliveries to once a day. (laughs) Now, we're not talking about the same post office to lose. I mean men. Oh, men. Well, darling, we have the biggest crop of magnificent men this town has had in years. Why, only... Only what? Well, there's a new thing that's come into fashion, darling. Uh, Men seem to like very young girls. Mm. (laughs) Thirty-five. Well, I got here just in time. <laughs> of course you did, darling. We can double date. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, uh, uh, let me see, uh, Beatty. I, I forget. Now, just what type of man do you prefer? 
Tall or short, fat or thin, old or young, dark or fair. Uh, yes. Uh, just my type, too, though. <laughs> oh, we'll have plenty of dates. Well, any of the men you've been going out with, Tallulah, are all right with me. Uh, uh, well, as a matter of fact, I've been so busy lately, darling, I've, um, I've been more or less relaxing, you know. Mm-hmm. I've taken up knitting. <laughs> I've just finished the most darling slipover for my icebox. <laughs> A cardigan, of course. Oh, naturally. It's so much easier, you know, to open the door. You have no idea how relaxing an evening can be just knitting. <laughs> but of course you were here for a gay time, and I'm sure we'll find plenty of men to take us out, so uh, don't you worry, darling. I'll see that you're kept busy. Hmm. Uh, tell me, darling, is it difficult to learn to knit? <laughs> Why, be, darling, you sound positively unhappy. Yes, I'm miserable. Oh, how delightful. Who is he? Was. Was, my dear, past tense. Well, who isn't? <laughs> was he a man you met in England? Uh, tell us about it, won't you, darling? I'll be glad to. Good gracious, what a routine you have to go through here before she lets you sing one lousy little number. <laughs> journey, they tell us, a journey right through to the end, and just like an everyday journey, it's nicer to go with a friend, we all need a traveling companion to help us along as they can, a man needs the help of a woman, a woman needs the help of a man. Now I found a traveling companion, one whom I thought was my own. How gaily we started. <laughs> now I'm broken hearted and making the journey alone. I was happy, oh so happy, and ready to depart. So I smiled at my companion, said, well, shall we start? And then a sticky label was slapped across my heart. Not wanted on the voyage. <laughs> it could have been so happy. It could have been sublime. We could have looked out of the portholes and been happy all the time. I planned to be his traveling rug. And now I find that I'm not wanted on the voyage. Why am I left at the quayside? Why does my world seem so stark? Why can't I get where I'm going? I can't even get off the mark. I had a lot of little parcels. Our friends, our hopes, our fears. A whole doll full of laughter and a suitcase full of tears. But fate, that cruel American express man, just points at me and jeers. You're not wanted on the voyage. <laughs> Get away now. Come on. I'll have the law on you. Does the road wind uphill all the way? Yes, to the very end. Is there a long, long trail winding? Yes, there is. Does he travel fastest who travels alone? <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> then what about her? What about she? I asked the station clock, dear old clock. It didn't answer. I asked the station approach. It didn't answer. And then I asked him. He answered. <laughs> in one, two, three, four, five, maybe a half a dozen words. I was amazed. <laughs> but I laughed. <laughs> I thought him joking. I said, oh, psh, don't be absurd. But he showed me what was written, and I read it word by word. 
I wasn't traveling with him. I wasn't even traveling third. I was not wanted on the voyage. The draft was hard and bitter. I could not drink the cup, and yet I had to swallow it. Yes, down to the last sup. To have been a weekend rucksack and then to finish up not wanted on the voyage, I ask you. <laughs> Friends have been kind and consoling. There's nothing they say they won't do. But they've all got their own traveling companions. And they are sticking to them like glue. <laughs> they say, you must go forward. Don't let your footsteps lag. But the memory of that moment pulls me backward like a drag. His gentle voice saying, Porter, just label that old bag. <laughs> <laughs> Not wanted on the void, me. Not wanted on the void. Here's a word from RCA Victor. There's nothing more fun these winter nights than curling up in front of a good warm television set and let the laughs, chuckles, and downright merriment of television entertainment warm the cockles of your heart. And if there's one thing that's more fun than just plain television, it's television on a new RCA Victor set. Yes, almost two million families today are happily using RCA Victor television in their homes. And you'll know why when you watch the lifelike picture on RCA Victor's new model, the Kent, now on display at your RCA Victor dealers. The Kent brings you clear, big, 17-inch pictures locked in place by RCA Victor's exclusive eyewitness picture synchronizer. Then, too, look at the value of the Kent. It's like having console television at table model price. You'll say that RCA Victor television is the best way to warm up your heart with television fun and keep the frost off your pocketbook. Excuse me, but uh, where do I get my money back on this uh, round-trip ticket from Boston? <laughs> what is your problem, Fred Allen? Well, I tried all week to get a ticket to the big show tonight, but there wasn't one to be had all over New York. So I flew up to Boston and bought a round-trip ticket on the show train, and that's how I got in. That's how I'm here. Right oh, now. Fred, darling, you didn't have to go to all that trouble to fly up to Boston by plane. Well, I didn't, uh, I didn't fly by plane, Tallulah. There's a man over at LaGuardia Field now with a new service. You stand on the runway with two hands full of large nails, and up in Boston there's a fellow with a big magnet. If you're flying to Boston, it's the only way to travel. If you like privacy, if you want to be alone, it's the only thing to do. Uh, well, Fred, but don't have now anything in your pockets uh, at the time. Yes, dear. Did I miss anything important? No, you did. <laughs> well, now that you've retired from radio and television, uh, what do you do to keep busy? Well, retired is rather a delicate way to put it, to Lula. Let us just say I was not wanted on the voyage. <laughs> There's really, a, there's really a lot to do here in New York. I keep, I manage to keep pretty busy, as a matter of fact. I get up every morning about 10 o'clock and go over to see my doctor. He hasn't been feeling well lately. <laughs> then for lunch, I go over to Lindy's and meet the boys. I order a lean corned beef sandwich and sit there and chew the fat for a while. <laughs> Well, I'm surprised you found time to come over here at all this week, Fred. Well, in all deference to your charms and your concentrated allure, Miss Bankhead, uh -huh. I really came over because Portland asked me to meet her here. She has a bit of a problem which she hopes to... Uh, hello, Mr. Allen. ...solve. Portland, you made me split an infinitive. I shall never be able to go back to Boston. I've split an infinitive. I'll have to Portland spend... Hoffa! <laughs> Hello, Miss Bankhead. 
Mr. Allen, did you tell Miss Bankhead why I'm here? No, I didn't have the heart to tell her, Portland. Matter of fact, I didn't have a line either. <laughs> well, Miss Bankhead, my name is Portland Hoffer. I know who you are, darling. Please, Miss Bankhead, I have a speech prepared. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. My name is Portland Hoffer. You sound like Dagmar tonight. <laughs> that line wasn't worth reading twice. Yeah. Portland, I have always been an admirer of yours, mm -hmm. and I have been chosen by my school alumni association to portray you to Lula Bankhead in a play to be presented next week. New paragraph. Well? Exclamation point. You can imagine how thrilled I was. Comma. When they told me I could portray you. Period. I've been so excited all week, I've had indigestion. Colon. <laughs> My meals. Semicolon. <laughs> well, darling, if you've quite finished dictating that letter, I wish you'd get to the point. Do you want me to come and play the part? Oh, no. I want to stand on my own two legs. Parenthesis. <laughs> I've been trying all week to copy your voice. <laughs> Isn't she sweet? Portland, that isn't even a reasonable facsimile. But then, who is? You're so right, Frederick. You took the words right out of my mouth. Well, I'm so sorry, Tallulah. Your mouth was open and there were so many of them there. <laughs> I've tried every way to make my voice sound that low. Really? But it doesn't work. No? I tried pasting down my Adam's apple with scotch tape. And that didn't do it? No. No. And then I tried wetting my hair yeah. and standing in front of an open window, hoping I'd get laryngitis. <laughs> yes, I know, darling. I lose more imitators that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, go on, Portland. What happened when you stood in front of the uh, open window with your wet hair? Did your voice sound like Tallulah's? No, but my hair looked like hers. <laughs> well, Tallulah, those are the ball facts. Now, can you, can you help Portland out with her problem? Well, Fred, I'll do anything I can, darling, for you and for Portland. But what is the reason for this play? I mean, why are you doing it at all? Well, we want to raise some money to buy equipment for our school basketball team. Oh, what kind of equipment are you going to buy for your basketball team? A center, a guard, and two referees. <laughs> Why, Portland, is that cricket? No, it's basketball. Our school hasn't won a game for 20 years. This would give our team a new lease on life. Say, Portland, you go, about, uh, you go around buying referees, and that's exactly what you'll get. 20 years to life. <laughs> Here, darlings, are two very good friends of ours, Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. Bob, do you realize we only have one thing in common? Hardly enough for a happy marriage, is it? <laughs> What's that, Bing? Chesterfields, of course. We both like them, we both sell them. And we'd better get to selling them now. You know, folks, better tasting Chesterfield is the only cigarette that combines for you mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. How do you know they're mild? Well, you just make our mildness test. You buy them, open them up, and enjoy that milder aroma. Then smoke a Chesterfield. You'll know it's milder because it smokes milder. And Chesterfield leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That fact has been confirmed by the country's first and only cigarette taste panel. So, always buy Chesterfield. Join me, Junior. Let's sum it up musically. Chesterfield, Chesterfield always takes first place. That milder, mild tobacco never leaves an aftertaste. So, open a pack, give them a smell, then you'll smoke them. Returning to a scene of his triumph on the big show is one of the truly great voices of our time, Mr. Lawrence Melchior, who 25 years ago tonight made his debut in opera in this country. Mr. Melchior will now sing a study to Tristan, Dreams by Wagner. Meredith, darling, if you please. <laughs> Yes. 
Melchior Bravo. Your divine voice is usable. We are honored to have you back on the big show. Tulula, it's always a pleasure to be in this show with you. Uh, since you were here last, Laurie, uh, darling, I've been doing uh, quite a bit of singing myself. Oh, I, I know. We have heard. Your voice has created a sensation in music circles everywhere. Oh, you're joking. Are you joking, darling? How can I be joking? I have no sense of humor. <laughs> uh, do you really mean that music circles think I'm a, I, I'm a sensation? <laughs> Tulula, 
You know, today I am celebrating the 25th anniversary of my operatic debut in this country. And I give you my word that you have created several new notes never known to the human ear. <laughs> you know, it's really, darling, oh, this is exciting news. I just can't wait to tell somebody. Oh, that's Jack Carson. Jack, darling. Yes, Tallulah? Jack, do you know what Lawrence Melchior just told me? He said that I have... Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. Uh, do you know La Lawrence uh, Melchior? Hello, Jack. Mr. Melchior. How do you do? Uh, uh, Jack, uh, Lawrence, just told hey, Mr. me... Mr. Malker, you've got much thinner, haven't you? Oh, yes, my doctor has put me on a strict diet. Uh, uh -huh. Jack, Lawrence, darling, just told me that my voice... I'm on a diet myself, you know. Uh, what kind of a diet? Jack, about my voice, well, it's a very I... simple diet. For breakfast, I have lunch and dinner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and for lunch, I have a midnight snack and tomorrow's breakfast. And for dinner, I have tomorrow's lunch and dinner. You see, it's a nine-day diet. I'm doing it in three days. <laughs> it's a new idea you can reduce without losing weight. Why, uh... Why did you try it, Mr. Melker? Oh, I, I'm happy with my doctor. He examined me and gave me his certificate. Oh? Uh, Jack, did you know that I have created notes? Let, me, let me see the certificate. Uh, uh, I'll read it to you. you see, uh, this is to certify that I have examined Mr. Melker and have found him to be physically fit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Look how he spells fit. F-A-T. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you two, a slap hippie gentleman, will let me get a word in here. Yes, Tallulah? I have been trying to tell you, Jack, that Lawrence just paid me a great compliment. He said that I am a sensation in music circles. I have created several new notes. New notes? That's right. Isn't that right, Lawrence, darling? Oh, uh, that's right. You see, the only known letters in the musical scale are A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Oh, yes, I've heard that rumor. Well, uh, we have located your notes slightly above G. Do you hear that, Jack? My notes are above G. That would be H, wouldn't it? It sounds like H to me. <laughs> Lawrence, darling, do you, think, uh, do you think music is ready for these new notes? Oh, they are getting ready. Pianos are being retuned and clarinets are being repitched and violins are being restrung. Razors are being resharpened. <laughs> Lawrence, you've given me renewed confidence. And so I'm going to sing a chorus of a song for you right now. Right now? Right now. Uh, Mr. Melchior, another thing about that diet I was telling you about. Uh -huh. The doctor said you should take long walks. How long? Mm, about 32 bars. Will you join me? Of course. Shall we go? <laughs> Come back here, you cowards! When we ask you to try anisin for the relief of pain due to a headache, neuritis, and neuralgia, we're not asking you to try a new or unproved method. For there are many people listening in now who have been introduced to anison tablets by their own dentist or physician. Now, you who have received anison this way know the effective, incredibly fast relief these tablets bring. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. People by the thousands are using modern anison today instead of other ways. Uh, doesn't their experience seem worth following? Try Anison the next time you suffer pains from headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted with the results. Ask your druggist for Anison today. Anison is spelled A N A C I N. <laughs> Well, darlings, in just a moment, Mr. Edwin will join Mr. Melchior and do one of his wonderfully funny opera interpretations. But first, a word from Ed Hurley High, who, hi, ho, he, ho, ho. Uh, Miss Bankhead, uh, Ed Hurley, he is on a short vacation. I've been doing the announcing. My name's Ben Grower. Oh, isn't that wonderful, darling? They finally gave me an announcer whose name I can pronounce. I'm glad you're here. Go right ahead, Ben Growler. Uh, this portion of the program has been brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, by Chesterfield, the cigarette that has, for you, mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste, the best cigarette for you to smoke, and by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. 
This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is the big show, and Tallulah is about to introduce... Ladies and gentlemen, one of the great, great clowns of the theater, Mr. Ed Wynn. Ed, darling, it's so nice of you to come on this show this week. Oh, well, I had to come, Tallulah. I thought where you got that fella, you know, that finger, uh, what's his name? Uh... Uh, Lawrence Melchior. Well, that's close enough, yes. <laughs> He's going to sing an opera, you know. And in this country, people don't understand those foreign language operas. I'm going to explain it. This is the latest story of Carmen I'm but going to darling, tell. darling, you explained Carmen the last two times you were on the show. Well, that doesn't mean anything. There are a lot of stories of Carmen. They all have different names, you know. Different names? Certainly. I saw Carmen last week at the Metropolitan. It was called the Marriage of Figaro, it was called. Well, now, how do you account for the change of name? Well, Carmen's the girl, you know. When she gets married, she changes her name, that's all. But really, tonight's story of Carmen is nothing like it. I'm sure of that. But, Ed, here's Mr. Melchior. Laura, do you remember Mr. Wen? Vividly. No matter what I sing, he only tells the story of Carmen. But you don't seem to realize, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh... Melchior, Lauritz Melchior. Well, that's close enough, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you see, I'm, a, I'm an expert on Carmen, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Wynn. Yeah. I don't think you know if you are Carmen or Gunn. <laughs> <laughs> you have to excuse me. I cracked the pun. You know, don't you crack them. You don't seem to realize that there are 12 different versions of the bull fight alone in Carmen. That's a lot of bull. <laughs> Look, young man. Uh, yeah, young man? Yeah, <laughs> there is only one authority on Carmen. Yeah? And that's the man who wrote the opera. Yeah? George Bisset. Oh, that's ridiculous. I know everything there is to know about Carmen. You are Bisset? Yeah, but not too busy to explain the opera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll explain the story of Carmen. But, Ed, tonight, I happen to be singing the hymn to Venus from Tannhäuser. Tannhäuser? Shows you how things are going up. It used to be five houses. Did you know that? <laughs> Everything's going up now, Dave. Terrible. But you're going to sing Carmen? No, I'm going to sing Tannhäuser. Oh. Next line is yours if you want to say it. I don't care. <laughs> oh, oh, why? Yes, I... I Huh? Oh, why <laughs> didn't I become a ballet dancer yeah. like my good mother wants me to? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Melchior singing the hymn to Venus from Tannhauser in German, Mr. Wern explaining it in common. <laughs> Pardon me, I'll, I'll explain it up till now. <laughs> you know, you can't, can't give the people too much to remember, you see. Now, this is the story of Carmen. As most of you know, Carmen was born in Spain on account of the beautiful scenery which is there. Now, Carmen, what a faith Carmen has. She has stardust in her eyes, stardust in her cheeks, stardust in her lips. <laughs> you never saw such a, I don't know, such a dustpan. Well, anyhow, <laughs> what I wanted to say was that Carmen is so magnificent, when she passes men, you can hear a loud whistle. But the men never whistle back. <laughs> the hero of the opera is Don Jose. Most of you know that. Don Jose makes a fourth landing on his way to see Carmen in Madrid, but he is in the jungle in his aeroplane. He meets a native girl, and trying to make her understand, he says to her, he says, me, me be city. Uh, me be uh, 39 in landing. And she says, me be 26 in October. <laughs> well, this infuriates Don Jose, and he rushes to meet Carmen. When he sees Carmen, he says, Carmen, every time when I get up in the morning and put my hands down around my knees and pull them up again, I get terrible pains in my back. <laughs> Carmen says, well, why do you do it? And Jose says, well, if you know any other way for a guy to get his pants on, I wish you'd tell me. <laughs> Now you continue the opera, will you? 
sich eine Macht mir glücklichen Herzschuh. That, that's enough for Wait, I'll explain that. I'll... Now, you see, in New York, Carmen and Don Jose, they take a trip to New York and they jump on a sightseeing bus. Carmen says to the driver, he says, no, she says, Carmen is a woman in this play. <laughs> she says, does this bus stop at the Waldorf Astoria? The driver says, no, we keep it in the garage. <laughs> I told it, some of them are worse than that. Anyhow, <laughs> Further on, the driver yells, we are now passing the biggest saloon in town. Don Jose jumps off the bus and says, maybe you are, but I'm not. <laughs> That's what I like. I don't know. That night at Carmen's birthday party, her mother turns to Carmen, and she says, Carmen, your birthday reminds me of the night you were born. Did you know, Carmen, dear, you were born in the middle of the night? Carmen says, gee, Mom, I hope I didn't wake you up. <laughs> Some of these will make humor illegal. But anyhow. <laughs> now, while Carmen and, and her mother are speaking, Don Jose is speaking to Carmen's father. He says, I would like to marry your daughter. The father says, can you support a family? Jose says, yes. Yeah. The father says, now think hard because there's seven of us. <laughs> but anyhow, Carmen and Don Jose get married. It's just as well because, I don't know, they couldn't get along together anyway. Now, would you continue? Uh, <laughs> Und es ist die keiner Holden Spesen Erheb mein Lied in lautem Jubelruf yes, uh, Pardon me, just, I'll explain that part. Yes. You don't mind, do you? This is very interesting. I've got to explain the story for opera lovers who don't care for music at all, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, Carmen and, and Don Jose are now married, and very soon, they are blessed with a six-year-old son. <laughs> the son has what you call Drew Pearson and Senator McCarthy needs. They're always knocking each other. You know? <laughs> well, look, the boy says to his father, he says, Papa, when I grow up, will I marry a woman like Mother? And his father says, you sure will if you're not careful. <laughs> then Don Jose says, well, the latest thing your mother did was to make her hair blonde. This anger's common. And she says, I see you've made your nose red. Don Jose says, yes, I have. But I don't have to go to the beauty parlor once a week to have the end touched up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't like it either. I don't know. <laughs> then how common. Common end says, let us kiss and make up. Why fight? And as they kiss, there is a loud explosion. It seems that he had a toothpick in his mouth and she was chewing bubble gum. See? <laughs> the explosion knocked Don out the window. The son says, look, mama, Pop fell out the 18-story window and killed himself. Carmen says, I can't understand it because just two weeks ago, he was vaccinated against everything. <laughs> Will you go on scene, please? <laughs> And then, of course, Carmen goes... One day at Macy's, uh, Carmen... Carmen goes... This guy certainly likes to sing. Mich sehen. 
Now, what he just sang, of course, was the last act, which naturally needs description because a lot of people didn't understand it. But it's in this act where you meet Escamillo. I'd like to describe him. Escamillo is the kind of a guy you would use for a blueprint if you were building an idiot. You know? <laughs> now, when he was 12 years old, when he was 12 years old, in one day he lost his father and mother. <laughs> what a crap game. But well, anyhow, <laughs> when he grows up, you know, Escamillo becomes a great sage. You see how I've connected the story there? He becomes a sage. One night he sees Carmen for the first time. She is dancing. Escamillo, the famous sage, goes off her. And he taps the man on the shoulder. He says, may I cut in? <laughs> That's good. I, I like that. Carmen, being a lady, coyly drops her eyelid. Escamillo, being a gentleman, stoops down and picks them up. <laughs> she said, I'm tired of dancing. I'll take off my shoe. <laughs> he looks, he says, those are the ten daintiest toes I have ever seen. <laughs> Carmen says, now I'll take off my other shoe. <laughs> <laughs> at this instant, at this instant, Carmen's father rushes to the bar and says, give me 22 drinks. The bartender at the ball says, well, why do you want 22 drinks? And Carmen says, on account of that sign over the bar, it says nobody saved under 21. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing like a good joke, and that was certainly not like a good joke. But anyhow, <laughs> they realize that something's wrong with Escamillo, you see, that is with a father. So Escamillo rushes Carmen's father to his hospital. It's a brand new hospital. In fact, this is the opening day. And they celebrate the opening of the hospital and Carmen's father at the same time. What an operation. This is a remarkable operation. From Carmen's father, they remove a piece of bar rail from the sole of his foot. <laughs> Very unusual thing. After the operation, Carmen asks Escamillo to her home. He goes there, but he is astonished at the sight. He says, this is ridiculous. He says, you have pigs in your living room. Carmen says, why not? There's everything in my living room a pig would want. <laughs> yes, wonderful opera. Suddenly, Carmen says, will you marry me? He says, you're asking me. I don't know what to say. Carmen says, just say yes, and from there on in, keep your big trap shut. <laughs> but as the curtain is coming down, Escamillo says, this is too much. I'm going to Hollywood and be a movie actor. Carmen yells, Hollywood, bah. One day you're kissing Lana Turner, the next day you're kissing Greer Garson, the next day you're kissing Betty Grable, and the next day you're a has-been. <laughs> and Escamillo says, yes, but just think where I has been. <laughs> yes. Ed, that was divinely hilarious. Thanks for another story of Carmen. And to you, Loris Melchior, our thanks for lending your magnificent voice to Mr. Wynne's inspired nonsense. And now here's an orchestra number for Meredith Wilson and his big show, Orchestra and Chorus, the number Hullabaloo, which is all about band music, which makes me very happy because I love band music. So don't be surprised, darlings, if I join in somewhere. Meredith, if you please. <laughs> Don't 
involved in any nauseating stories about your hometown, let's go on Wait to... Wait a minute, Tallulah. I'd like to meet that nice gentleman. Oh, Beatrice, Lily, darling, no. Meredith is a wonderful musician. I simply adore him and all that, but he can be such a bore. Oh, I adore bores. <laughs> you know, we fought a war over them. <laughs> Please introduce me. Oh, very well, if you must, Meredith, darling. Yes, Miss Bankhead. This. This is Beatrice Lily, Meredith Wilson. Hello, Meredith. Tallulah tells me you're quite a bore. Well, thank you. I do my best. Oh, well, I adore bores. God, say something boring. <laughs> well, I, I guess I didn't exactly expect to be called on at this time. Never was very good at doing any impromptu boring. <laughs> well, I like that band number you just played. When did you start leading a band? That should have a pretty boring answer. <laughs> well, sir, Miss Bankhead. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you too, Miss Lily. The first orchestra I ever had was really a doozy. It was the high school orchestra back in Mason City, Iowa. That's my hometown, you know. Yes, I know. We had a girl bandsman who played the euphonium. You know what that is. Oh. That's a big brass horn, and it only belongs in a band, not in an orchestra like we had back in Mason City. Well, I'll never forget that one particular night. This girl played the euphonium, and she was always just one beat early. Uh, would you care to hear how it sounded, Miss Lily? Oh, Lord, I'd love to. Sounds so boring. <laughs> would you like to hear it, Tulu? I don't even know what he's talking about. Here. He mentioned something about a euphonium. What's that? I think it's a small town in Iowa. <laughs> no. You see, euphonium is a big brass horn. It was in uh, my high school, my hometown, Mason City, in the high school orchestra. I can hear that orchestra yet. Fred, Fred and I want to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, what is it, gentlemen? Uh, do you want to tell her, sure, Jack? Sure, I'll tell her, Fred. I'm not afraid of her. Good, good. Tulu, so, we, um, we were listening to Edwin explain that opera before. And uh, we he got to thinking that too many people don't understand opera in the first place. And why doesn't somebody on this program 
uh, you know, explain a popular song. But I don't understand, darlings, in a popular song. The lyric is, uh, well, it's self-explanatory. Not the way you sing it. <laughs> Darling, are you implying that I don't sing a popular song? Well, when you start out singing it, it's popular. <laughs> You see, Tallulah, what Jack means is that there's always a story behind every popular song. Now, what was that song that used to be so popular before you recorded it? I'll be seeing you. That's yeah, the that's one, the yes. one. That's Would the one. you care to, uh, for want of a better word, sing it for us? <laughs> Fred and I will explain the story behind yes. it. Well, I'd love to, darlings. I just love to sing. Well, how do you get the right key? Do you use the Holland Tunnel for a pitch pipe? <laughs> She does need a pet. She's a walking euphonium. Oh, really? <laughs> Meredith <coughs> will give me my key, won't you, darling? Sure. All of them. <laughs> oh, thank you, darling. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the glamorous and unpredictable baritone voice of Miss Tallulah Brockman Bankhead singing, I'll be seeing you. Ah. <clears throat> Seeing you in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine embraces all day through. <laughs> that, that's not oh, right. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain that part of it, see? <laughs> we, uh, get carried away. Fred and I will explain it up to here. Um, hello, Jack. Oh, hi, Fred. Have you seen Tallulah around lately? Tallulah who? You know, Tallulah Bankhead. Oh, him. <laughs> no, I, I haven't, Jack, and I have looked in all of the old familiar places. Did you see any old familiar faces? Uh, not Tallulah's. Did you look in the Luxor baths? <laughs> But I didn't see any familiar faces there either. In that small cafe, the park across the way, the children's carousel, the chestnut tree, the wishing well. Fred, I'm worried about Tallulah. I wonder if she's broke. Well, I hear she's flat. Yeah, I just heard it. <laughs> I just heard it, too. <laughs> but I still wonder if she's broke. Jack, she must be. You know, she spends so much money on clothes. Did you ever notice that mink coat? Well, I happen to know that somebody gave her that mink coat. Oh, really? What did she have to do for it? <laughs> Nothing, just lengthen the sleeves. Oh, <laughs> You know, she used to spend all of her money on jewelry, but they won't let her into Tiffany's anymore. They won't? Why not? Well, she has such a terrible acid condition, the minute she walks in, all of the rings in the place turn green. <laughs> I'll be seen <clears throat> in every lovely summer's day. In everything that's light and gay I'll always think of you that way Jack, frankly, I'm worried about Tallulah Let's go down to police headquarters and give them a description of her A description of Tallulah? Yeah They'd never believe it <laughs> You know what I think? She must have had a big fight with some guy that she's in love with Well, I tell you, let's make the rounds of the hospitals Maybe she's visiting him. She'd be... Wait, get... wait a minute. Did you hear something? I think it's Tallulah. Listen. Find you in the morning sun And when the night is new No, no, it's only a steamship coming in to die. <laughs> we'll be looking at the moon That I'm
Well, darlings, that's it for this week. We hope you'll all be with us next Sunday when we will have with us Uta Hagen, Jack Haley, Paul Kelly, James Melton, Olson and Johnson, Monty Woolley, and others, and, of course, our very own Meredith Wilson and the big show, Orchestra and Chorus. Until then, may the good Lord bless and keep you, whether near or far away. Meredith? May you find that long-awaited golden day today be May your troubles all be small ones And your fortune ten times ten, Fred May the good Lord bless and keep you Till we meet again, Portland May you walk with sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree, Ed. May there be a silver lining back of every cloud you see, Jack. Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows. Never mind what might have been, Dennis. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. Lawrence? May you long recall each rainbow, then you'll soon forget the rain. May the warm and tender memories be the ones that will remain. Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows. Never mind what might have been. May the good Lord bless and keep you until we meet again. Good night, darlings, and Godspeed to our armed forces who hear these broadcasts each week all over the world. The Big Show is produced and directed by D. Engelbach and written by Goodman Ace, Fred Allen, Selma Diamond, George Foster, Mort Green, and Frank Wilson. This is Ben Grauer saying good night. Coming up, Phil Harris and Alice Faye. Then enjoy Hedda Hopper's show on NBC.